Yeah. All right, great. Excuse me, Ina. Ina. She's on the telephone. I wanted to shut the door so you won't hear. Do you want us to go do it? What? Would you shut the door because the sound's coming through, dear? The sound of your phone calls coming through. I'm not making any more to pay. I don't do the bad business stuff so well. And two papers got stuck, and I had to call the lady who was getting the fax. See, you were right. I should have had my hair cut. <laughs> <laughs> this is my wife of 53 years. It's okay. nice to meet you. I went to medical school, too. Not, not really. Not, you know. not officially. OK, <laughs> these, these people want to get started. OK. okay. Question or anything? Yep. Yeah. So can you tell us where and when you went to medical school? Okay. I went to medical school at Tufts. Tufts was then as it is now in Boston. I was in the class that enrolled in 1948 and graduated in 1952. Prior to going to Tufts, I was a student at Clark here in Worcester. I'm originally from Boston, and after I had gotten out of the service in 1945, Clark had a class starting at a time that was propitious, so I went to Clark, and Clark was especially good for people who wanted to go to medical school. Out of a class of 20 pre-meds, nine of us got in, and uh, I went to Tufts, and I, I was not uh, the outstanding medical student at Tufts, but I did graduate in time, and had developed an interest in mental illness during my time of service in the military where I worked in a mental hospital. So I knew pretty much after, during my career at uh, medical school and my internship at Cambridge City Hospital, that that's what I wanted to do. And I went, uh, I interned at Cambridge City Hospital and I did uh, two years of training at Yale and one year at the Boston VA Hospital. While at Clark, I met my wife. We were married the se our senior year in college. And she worked for three years during our first three years of medical school. And we supplemented the GI Bill, and I, we were able to get through medical school until we graduated. And by the time I was an intern, we had two children. One, who, one of whom is now 49, the other is 48, and we have a third child who's 43. We came to Worcester in July of 1956. You know, your, inter your residency year and internship year ends in July. And the uh, Worcester is my wife's home. I'm originally from Boston, so we had some familiarity with it. And at the time, there was a position available in the outpatient clinic of the, of the Worcester VA office that paid $8,900, $8,990, which was a good start for a husband and wife and two children and a third one on the way. Also, the psychiatric um, situation in Boston was such that there were more psychiatrists uh, than could possibly make a living, and Worcester held much more promise. So off we came, and uh, we came to Worcester, which was an interesting experience. Uh, having grown up in Boston, most of the well, family practitioners, general practitioners, had offices and three-deckers, etc. But in Worcester, most of the physicians had offices in the downtown area. There was, on Lower Pleasant Street, a building called the Medical Arts Building, and that's just what it was. This is where the physicians had their offices. And they had their offices in places like the Commerce Building and the uh, State Mutual Building, and this is where the physicians were. Most of the physicians, the vast majority, were men. And the vast majority were veterans of World War II. Uh, I, you know, in pre preparing for your coming, I thought to myself, now, how many women do I know who were practicing in 1956? And there may be four. There was a woman named 
Mary Shannon, who practiced near Newton Square. Uh, there was a woman named Dr. Italia Digenis Granada, who practiced in, um, on Shrewsbury Street. And then the, there was another woman whose name was, the only name I knew for her, remember for her, was Olive. And then there was, and she's still alive today, is Jane Fitzpatrick. Jane Fitzpatrick is a legendary pediatrician. Obviously, you can tell she's a good friend of mine. And uh, that's, that's what there was. Uh, the hospitals seemed to dominate the scene. Uh, St. Vincent Hospital had just come off a major building program. They had had uh, their previous building had been uh, what is now down at the bottom of the hill near Vernon Street where you see the office building. And the white building was just about brand new. And at the time, St. Vincent Hospital had constructed the second closed psychiatric unit in a general hospital. The first one being at St. Elizabeth's in Boston, which is an interesting thing because the, uh, in contradiction to what most people's impression was at the time, the Roman Catholic Church had opened up their arms to the treatment of the mentally ill before the others had. They developed uh, St. Elizabeth's and St. Vincent. And of course, it was very desirable to get on the staff there. Well, there was St. Vincent, and down below the hill on Belmont Street was Memorial Hospital. Memorial Hospital was alleged and gave the impression it was the hospital where those who came to Worcester first practiced and went for their health care. Uh, and it was a, an interesting phenomenon and then there was Hahnemann Hospital, which was considerably smaller than the others, and Fairlawn Hospital, which was up on May Street. And then near Lincoln Square was Doctors Hospital. Now, I don't know if you've discovered this in, in your work, but in 1956, there was a coterie of physicians in Worcester and Massachusetts who had gone to two medical schools, one called College of Physicians and Surgeons, which was located on Shamit Avenue in Boston, and the other one was Middlesex University School of Medicine, which is, which is now where Brandeis is. And these schools were recognized, their graduates were recognized to practice medicine only in Massachusetts. And uh, the other physicians made it difficult for them, or the medical society, somebody, for them to practice. Uh, in order for them to become members of the medical society, they had to have sponsors. Uh, it was very difficult for them to get on hospital staffs. So they built their own hospital. And then there were one or two small, I guess one could call it cottage hospitals, right within the city. And as you went out to the outskirts, there was a hospital in Holden called the Holden Hospital, which only recently, uh, recently being the last five years, uh, went under, was absorbed by the um, Memorial Hospital conglomerate. And there were hospitals in Marlborough and in Athol and in Barry and in Winchenden. And uh, these were hospitals where people practiced. Now, what was it like in the hospital? The hospitals, in my view, let me say, were all controlled by small groups. There were three or four surgeons, and they controlled which surgeons got on the surgical staff. And uh, there were three or four internists who did that, and OBGYN people did that. It was very difficult to get on the hospital staff. And in my time, in order to practice effectively and to get to know physicians, you had to be on the hospital staff. And uh, I was uh, a secondary referred to specialists, psychiatrists, you know. Very few patients went directly to a psychiatrist. Uh, and I made the mistake of applying to the staff at St. Vincent Hospital 
without first becoming a member of the medical society and had to sit it out for a year. And subsequently, I would do anything to moonlight to make enough money to support my family, but then get on the staff at St. Vincent Hospital and the staff at Memorial. Uh, the, the staffs uh, of the hospitals were not what you'd call open staffs. Uh, they were open ostensibly. It would appear that they were open, but uh, powerful people could vote you off. If, if, for instance, they felt, well, gee, you know, we have three ophthalmologists on our staff and one of us isn't doing as well as he or she would like, uh, then maybe we shouldn't take this new person. And uh, it, it was tough. Uh, practices were slow to build up, but then they, they built up. The um, general practitioners did very well. The um, specialists did well. The pediatricians did well. And the psychiatrists did well. Uh, at St. Vincent Hospital, uh, we did a lot of electroshock treatment. Now, if you keep in mind, 1956 was a time when the uh, antipsychotics first came out, Thorazine and Milltown, etc., and St. Vincent's and uh, their psychiatric unit made the turnaround until recently the shock treatments come back with managed care, etc. So I practiced from 1956 uh, at St. Vincent Hospital. In the last 13 years of my career there, I was chief of psychiatry there. For a short time, because there was no activity, and I was young and a man of a little bit of energy, I was also chief of psychiatry at Memorial Hospital till we tried to build it up. And uh, the, what happened, I had to make a choice and Dr. Howard Berger, an extremely competent man, came from McLean to be the chief there. Then came the medical school. And the medical school, my friends, did not come easy. Uh, there were people in Worcester who felt, well, here I am, I'm a general surgeon, I'm doing all kinds of surgery, and nobody is telling me yay, nay, or whatever and they're going to bring in the medical school and I have to boost up my standards, I'm going to have to improve my record keeping. I don't want the medical school, I'm doing very well without it. So there was that element. And then there were others of us who thought, gee, this, this would be great, think of all the prestige and tell my grandchildren, your grandfather was a big shot at the medical school and all kinds of things. And then there were medical politics that wanted to bring the medical school elsewhere, and there were politic, political politics. You know, if you are a state representative from Holyoke, for instance, you just as soon have the medical school in Holyoke because it brings in a lot of money, as you guys can see. Well, the, the battle went on. The Boston medical schools did not succumb easily because they had the control at the time with Harvard, BU, and Tufts. They had the control. They, you know, there were things. Things were rumored that they told the legislature each of them would take in more medical students, so there would be no need to build a whole new structure, or they would run the medical school, etc. It was rumored that others wanted the medical school in Amherst. What a wonderful thing! They could fly patients in from uh, Albany and all kinds of places. Well, my best guess is that politically it ended up here. And Dr. Souter, the first dean, chancellor, etc., came with a handful of people. He brought uh, Brownie Wheeler. He brought, Bra Brownie was a surgeon. Roger Hickler, who was chief of medicine. Uh, and they did not have a chief of pediatrics. Uh, they selected John Duggan to be acting chief of pediatrics. They had a, an obstetrician named Zwirek who came from Springfield. He didn't stay long. They had Mo Goodman, who's still here, who's probably one of your teachers. He was physiology. And uh, 
Don Tipper was uh, one of the regular people. And then they beefed it up with people from the local community. And I was selected to be acting chief of psychiatry, which is something I think surprised everybody, including me. And there's a story behind that. In my fourth year of medical school in Boston, I was a clinical clerk in surgery. And at one time, our team was doing a chest procedure. And we were waiting for this big shot guy to bring his chest equipment to do the procedure. It turned out to be Dr. Lamar Suda. And I was fourth scrub from the fifth end there. And we worked together beautifully. It was one of my better days. And I gave him an excellent assist. And he, you never met him. I'm, it's too bad. And he was, he was gruff but tough. And he took a liking to me. And he said, uh, Doctor, uh, what are you going to do? And I said, well, eventually I hope to be a psychiatrist, sir. I said, what a waste of time. You should go into surgery. And lo and behold, this must have been 10 years at least later, he met me and uh, he heard that I was practicing psychiatry reasonably successfully in Worcester, and that's how I got that position. And at the time when the medical school came, the... Uh, Local practitioners really controlled the practice of medicine in the city. Uh, St. Vincent at one time had between 400 and 600 beds. Memorial had a lot of beds. So did Hahnemann and Fairlawn, etc. And it was, changes were made. The medical school very shrewdly selected uh, people from the city, uh, to, to interact in the departments and uh, gradually grew. At first, the medical school had their department chiefs in the local hospitals. Brownie Wheeler practiced at Memorial, and Roger Hickler, who was then chief of medicine, practiced at um, St. Vincent, I think. Yeah, I think that's what it was. And the, uh, the names, I think, well, I can't come up with the name of the chief of, oh, John Duggan was the chief of pediatrics. It was an exciting time, and gradually the practice of medicine has changed in Worcester uh, with the onset of managed care and uh, m a number of physicians, I won't say most, will tell you it isn't what it used to be in that you do not have the freewheeling entrepreneurial uh, ability to do what you want, it isn't. In that if you know your stuff and your intentions are right and you don't get overwhelmed by a little paperwork, it's good. I have no regrets for my 40 years in medicine. And I have no regrets for my 40 years in psychiatry. Everybody will tell you, you know, psychiatry is one of the next to pediatrics. It used to be the lowest paid specialty. But uh, my three children went to college. My daughter is a physician. So, you know, we didn't do too badly. We, did, we uh, don't have yachts. And, uh, since I can't swim, it wouldn't have been a good idea anyway. But it, it's been good, and I anticipate it will be good for you. Uh, I would now, if you have any, anticipate any questions. you have any questions? Um, can you talk about how the science of psychiatry has changed since you first went into it? Who told you to ask that question? <laughs> yeah, it, it's changed. Wonderful question. It's changed. I trained in Boston. I trained in a predominantly Freudian psychoanalytical framework. And that meant that almost all psychiatry was based on Freudian psychoanalysis. Analysis. And that was um, the cause of psychoses and neuroses. And treatment was basically done, uh, well, you did five days a week treatment on a couch, one day a week treatment across the table from one another. And there were varieties of psychotherapy. The medications that we had were 
mostly sedation. And uh, the other two arms of treatment, one were both hospital arms, was electroshock treatment. Now, when you say electroshock treatment to lay folk, they immediately throw up their hands and say, it's terrible, terrible, primitive, etc. But I have to point out that this is the year 2000. Electroshock treatment started in 1936 and has survived as a, a, a mode of treatment since. It's changed. Uh, we would give a convulsant drug and the patient would convulse and they'd be awake. Now we, we do it with uh, anesthetist, anesthesiologist in hospital situations. And it seems, as I continue to read the literature, it seems to be still the best treatment for um, depression. And the insulin shock was also, where, where they'd bring the patient down into an insulin coma, was also a treatment of choice then. That was a hospital treatment. And that, that's rare. I don't know if it's used anymore, any place. So that I opened up my office in 1956, and I was deeply steeped, although I was never a psychoanalyst in, in psychotherapy. Patient came to me, I'd make a diagnosis, what was the treatment, uh, psychotherapy once or twice a week, and we'd uh, target certain symptoms. Then, lo and behold, I think it was in 1954, the antipsychotics came up with the first one being Thorazine. Thorazine was, yeah, an antipsychotic, and then that followed with antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications and uh, anti-obsessive compulsive medications and a whole slew of them. And psychiatry seemed to switch to uh, that which is based, as you put it, in science and in the molecule and had real findings through the microscope. And uh, psychiatry rejoined, I like to think, uh, the family of medicine based on real science. Not that that does not remain. Many, many honest practicing psychoanalysts who feel for certain condition, character disorders, anxiety disorders, that uh, psychotherapy still does not remain the treatment of choice. But the basic, as I view it now, basic psychiatric treatment is the judicious use of medications. You know, the drugs, if you say drugs, people get nervous. The judicious use of medications plus psychotherapy, supportive therapy. If a patient comes to me and they're obviously depressed and I give them Prozac, for instance, and send them out the door, it's not as effective as the patient feels that I care for them, that I want for them to get better, and I'm invested emotionally in the medication. So to be, in my view, a skillful psychiatrist still requires, even though the medications are helpful, a good knowledge of interpersonal relationships, psychotherapy, and medication. That's, that's, that's how it's changed. Has managed care influenced that role that a psychiatrist is able to play with their patient? Well, you should know that as part of my career at one point in time, I was the director of a managed a mental health managed care company who was the, called, uh, what was it called? Uh, Behavioral Managed Care Associates or whatever. And it was my, it, my concept was that we could judiciously figure out a way in which the patient could get the best shot for the buck because inste instead of just dealing doctor and patient, and the patient when you're mentally ill or disturbed, it's hard to know what's going on, the payer could be a kindly third party involved. Well, it didn't work out that way. The third parties began to restrict the number of visits. They began to require of the provider, now previously the psychiatrist, what should be done how many visits it would take in advance. They began to do it on graphs so that if you came in with a diagnosis of obsessive compulsive disorder, you were entitled to so many treatments. If 
if things weren't going well, the burden of proof was on the back of the physician to prove that uh, things had to be done that way. We then had non-medical providers doing psychologists and social work, social workers doing psychotherapy, and it was hard for lay folks to see the difference. You know, they're both doing the talking treatment, so the psychiatrists, a good number of them, began to uh, do just medication treatment and kind of be supervisors for the social work. It's made a big impact. Uh, it's impacted in that, you know, you, uh, you don't have a free hand any more than the surgeon has a free hand. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story. About 15 or 18 years ago, I had a cataract removed in the left eye. And I got the bill from Blue Cross Blue Shield and it said, cost $1,100. That's a long time ago. And I said to the surgeon, a good friend, I said, gee whiz, $1,100 for 45 minutes would probably take me a whole week to make that much money. But then the guy looked me right in my good eye now. He said, but doctor, how much is your sight worth? So, you know, you, you think about that and but somebody has to control the press strings. I used to know, used to, the people used to say 13% of the gross national product is going into health care, et cetera, and the United States gets the worst value for the dollar in the civilized world, et cetera. I don't like managed care. I don't like what it, it's done for the relationship between physician and patient. Uh, I, from the physician's point of view, from the physician's point of view, unmanaged care, fee-for-service was very good. Uh, I don't know how it's going to be. I don't know how it's going to be for the patient, but I do know managed care is very tough for the physician. I speak also from another point of view. My daughter is a physician, practices infectious diseases in Denver. And she, for instance, if she has a, a patient referred to her by a primary care doctor who has an infectious disease, she has to call up the insurance company and say, describe the symptoms before she can start treatment or they won't pay. So it, how do you think it became, how do you think it reached a point where there had to be some control over the cost of health care? And did Medicare or Medicaid have anything to do with that? Uh, how did it come to be? I, I think the costs got out of hand. Uh, I think uh, when the providers, the physicians, began to become the richest people in our society, almost, as, almost like the uh, Welchers of GE, uh, that was, was bad. And hospital costs uh, became out of sight. Uh, you know, if the, if the working man today had to pay for his or her own hospital bill or care, it just wouldn't be possible, just wouldn't be possible. Med, Medicare, uh, Medicare uh, when I first started practicing, it was just about the time Medicare became available. It worked very nicely. Their fee schedule was a little less than Blue Cross Blue Shield was paying. And yeah, it, it, play, it, it played a role, you know, it was nice. Um, you knew you would get paid for almost everything you did. Uh, and it, it made it a great kind of uh, bonus to have that happen. Incidentally, early on when I first went into practice, Blue Cross Blue Shield would pay for psychiatric services in a hospital but not outside of a hospital. So if I had a patient in a hospital, I might get $10 a day for visiting the patient in the hospital. And I could easily have three, six patients in a hospital uh, versus, and these, these were days when you'd get $20 an hour in the office. So the, most of the services Blue Cross Blue Shield started were paying for, for inpatient, and I think that played a role too. Can you talk a little bit about your experience in World War II and 
how that made you uh, interested in psychiatry? I like to say, you know, I've thought about these things before. I was very, I was very fortunate in World War II. Uh, I went into the service shortly after my 18th birthday, and I was in what they called a uh, uh, litter company. It was our job, as you picture me at 18, as a big, strong guy, it was our job to carry litters from the front lines. And most of my colleagues in the company weren't very bright. Where they weren't, no, excuse me, they weren't educated. And I had already had a year of college. And I was, so when an opportunity came to be sent to surgical technician school, I was sent. I went to surgical technician school, and I came back, and lo and behold, while I was gone, my company was mobilized, and I was there with a handful of other people. So they had nothing left to do with me but to send me to a, um, a hospital where I, this was a mental hospital, they sent me there and I worked there and I did that for the better part of a year and then they needed people in, um, the name will come to me, Camp Butner, North Carolina, which is in, near Durham, North Carolina, you may know where Durham is, and there was a big, 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 as far as the eye could see, this was a rehab hospital. And uh, they had a lot of psychiatric patients. And, and these troops had been the victims of the, well, the then Battle of the Bulge. Did you guys remember the battle? No, no of the Battle of the Bulge? Yeah, and there was an enormous amount of, of troops. And uh, I was involved in psychotherapy and sedating them. And, you know, it, it struck me, uh, it, this, this was a good thing for me to do. And I enjoyed psychology in uh, undergraduate school. And uh, if you won't tell anybody, uh, uh, the surgery was not my strongest suit. And I liked it. I liked it. It, it came easy. No, I shouldn't say it came easy, but it was something that came naturally to me. That's about the best I can answer that one. Do you think that the way psychiatry is taught has changed? Yeah, I think, well, it has to because in, the, uh, in my time, uh, it was taught in the state hospitals. The state hospitals have shrunk so, and some of them have closed. And now uh, the psychiatry is taught in the outpatient clinics at the hospital, and I would hazard a guess that they're taught in doctors' offices, uh, in situations like that. So yeah, it, it's changed. But more, more than that, the nation has come to see the mentally ill and the emotionally disturbed in a different view for the most part. If you walk down the streets of New York and you see a homeless person who's dressed bizarrely, people still make a circle around them. But you can still see Prozac advertised in the paper. And it's, you know, it's something that you don't whisper about anymore. So from that point of view, yes, it has changed. Do you think that's a positive change? Yeah, I think it's a positive change. I, I think it's important, uh, you know, if if you have ever been involved in your family or in your friends with somebody who becomes mentally ill, real mentally ill, you know, a real psychosis, it's a life destroyer. It takes away the guts, the spark, the pleasure. And, you know, I used to get very angry when my non-psychiatric colleagues would put down mentally ill people. You know, it, you might as well be dead. You, you, you don't participate in life. It's a terrible thing to be mentally ill. Uh, so I think it's important that we recognize the mentally ill as, as part, of, part of our world. It's too late for me now. I can't do anything. <laughs> I have a bad knee, but yeah. yeah. Going back to managed care for a minute, you said there's been some negative aspects of it. Do you feel that has changed the way physicians, current physicians, and Physicians who are retired now view medicine and are they happy practicing medicine? Some are and some aren't. 
Um, I see a lot of physicians practicing in groups, uh, you know, closed panel groups like the Fallon, and I see a lot of physicians practicing in open panel groups like, you know, the various HMOs. I think uh, in this country, in the United States, we're used to freedom, freedom of practice, etc. And if somebody once told me, the, and this was a number, probably 20 years ago, that the average individual who goes into medicine's father was a small grocer or ran a little meat market, the children of entrepreneurs. Well, you don't have the entrepreneurial kind of aspect. You operate within a big framework. But nowadays, in order, for this thing, for my knee, in order to have this done, you couldn't go to a, an orthopedic surgeon practicing by himself. You know, I needed old, uh, occupational therapy and uh, rehabilitation therapy and, and anesthesia and the whole thing. I, I think for the improvement of patient care, I think we have to have some practices in groups. Uh, my daughter is a, practices as a group of four in Denver, she practices infectious diseases. I, she does well because the group is strong enough and identified enough so they can do it. Whether she could do it by herself, I'm not so sure. Did you mention that um, used to be solo practice, used to be the predominant? Yeah. Do you think now not only group practices with physicians, but there are also non-physicians? Uh, giving care more and more often now. Is that been positive, do you think, in terms of the quality of care patients are receiving? Well, you ask a psychiatrist whether a non-psychiatrist providing mental health care is a positive aspect, more than likely he or she is going to say no. Uh, but I think if you could exercise some, the same kind of controls over the delivery of care from non-psychiatrists uh, as you can with psychiatrists, I think it will improve the care, it will give more people a chance to have the care, but the psychiatrist, because of the complexities now of mental health, with, you know, the sciences of it, need a psychiatric input. Uh, when I had my knee operation, there were all kinds of non-physicians involved, of nurses and uh, special care technicians, etc. They're helping hands, and not helping hands to the physician, helping hands to the patient. We can use all the help we can get. Um, in Worcester, do you think patients who've needed care have always had access to it? Always. I mean, historically. Or when yeah. have they, when haven't they? Okay, let's go back. When I came to Worcester, 1956, each hospital had outpatient clinics. They had outpatient dermatology clinics, they had outpatient mental health clinics, they had outpatient eye clinics, they had all kinds of things. And if you had need, but no money, you would line up on a Thursday morning, for instance, the outpatient eye clinic, and you'd see the, the biggest shot in, in, in eye services, and he'd give you, keep your mind open, the same care as you'd get in his office downtown, except instead of waiting only three quarters of an hour in his office downtown, you might wait three hours at the clinic. And instead of getting 10 minutes in the office downtown, you might get two minutes. Uh, if it was uh, the clinic was one that had an out, had the residency program, you might be seen first by the resident and then by the attending who would be in attendance. And the quality of the care rendered at these outpatient clinics varied. Yeah, so you could get care here, uh, and it was a, a crapshoot. You know how good it might be. Um, the, in my view, and, and I may differ from this than a lot of people, in a place like Worcester, the failure to get health care is the failure to know how to do it. 
to know how to make the system work. And there are, there are some people w w without any money make the system work for themselves wonderfully. You know, if a patient turns up at the ER Memorial Hospital and has a bleeding wound, sure as hell they're not going to turn him away. And, and at the medical school. But I would hate to think of that patient uh, having that kind of problem out in uh, Fisherville. You know where Fisherville is? Out, out that way. So it's one of the small communities in the city. So yeah, I, the question was, do I think it's available? Yes, it's available. The knowing how to get it is the question. And let us be frank with each other. Uh, we like to treat people who look like us. You know, uh, when you contemplated medicine, you had a certain kind of patient you thought you would treat. You didn't want to come into your waiting room and have a smelly, dirty patient waiting for you. Uh, who, who First, you'd have to wash your hands. You'd hate to go home to your family having treated such a patient. So, you know, these people have problems. It's society's problems, not just medical problems. How has all the consolidation of hospitals affected care? You guys are all right. <laughs> um, I think it has, and you know, what I say isn't gospel, it's my own opinion. When I first got here, let's go, we, we had Worcester City Hospital, we had St. Vincent, we had Memorial, we had Hahnemann, we had Phelan, we had doctors, and up the street of peace we had Holden. And all kinds of procedures were being done in these hospitals. There is a hospital not far from here. I was a psychiatrist. I saw a woman who had problems with her body image. She had just recently had an umbilolectomy done by a local surgeon. She had complained that she didn't like the way her umbilicus looked, and he operated on it. And in the, we had scattered hospitals, scattered levels of care. That could happen. Now it doesn't happen. I think, in general, although the trauma of the birth and the winnow, winnowing down of the hospitals has been uh, difficult for a lot of physicians and patients, I think it's a good thing. I think a higher level of care is now being provided to the citizens of Worcester with fewer hospitals than we had before. I just came off, I'm still involved, with the fail, a fail on rehab. That's wonderful. You know, I would put that against any place in New York or Boston, the care I get that, and it's specialized. And uh, so in answer to your question, yes, I think the consolidation and the merger of hospitals has given people an opportunity to specialize and get better equipment. Um, you know, you How do you feel physicians are perceived by the public now as opposed to when you first did your practice? I think when I first went into practice, I think people looked at, at physicians, and let me, let me give you some, I had a big practice from Southbridge, you know where Southbridge is? And these people would call me Mr. Doctor, and they would be very deferential. You know, they would, they'd, they'd shower before they came to see me. And uh, there was always cash on the table. They, they wouldn't dare come to see the doctor unless they, they were truly prepared. And uh, this was in part a result of the times. Early on, we had a, an immigrant class, and physicians, priests, school teachers, other clergy were the only educated people in the community. So everybody looked up to us. Well, the physician walked across the land with a tremendous aura. He made, a, he or she, very rarely she, made a good deal of money, lived well, dressed well. When, when I was in medical school, the head of OBGYN at Tufts had a chauffeur-driven limousine. Can you picture that now? 
big black car. He was always able to park it by a fire hydrant. Well, at any rate, in answer to your question, how were they perceived then? A lot differently than they are now. Now they're perceived as educated people who are able to offer a service and uh, the, the uh, exotic specialists, you know, the cardiac surgeons, the brain surgeons, they get a slightly higher level of respect. The psychiatrists get the same medium level of respect that we always got. But I think it's less than it used to be. Um, how have you seen the demographics of Worcester change since you've been here? Uh, Worcester has always been a good place to bring up children. My wife was born here. I came here willingly. Our three children went to public school here and all went on to graduate schools and professional careers. It was then, then, it was a good place to get educated, etc. I think I've seen in Worcester a thinning out, and this is not my expertise, of the upper middle class and a thickening of the middle middle class and the lower middle class. Uh, we, don't, we don't seem to have the, the kind of industry we had that uh, gave us Do you want to turn it on? Um, I've got plenty of time because this is where I live now. <laughs> um, just to wrap up, what would you advise young doctors going into practice today? What advice would you have for them? All right. I would suggest to a young physician, he or she, choose a line of work, a specialty as it were, where he or she feels most useful, most productive, and most skillful. Uh, I would not be ashamed to tell them that you have to pick something that will provide you with an adequate livelihood so that you can educate your family. But if you, because if you have to work your tail off and your spouse also has to work and got a lousy family life, you're in serious trouble. So pick out what you like, something that pays reasonably well. Be realistic. If you have big, thick hands and fingers, don't become an ophthalmologist, you know. It, certain, things, certain things God has said we cannot do. I would nowadays try to choose a community in which I would enjoy living. Some people like to live in the country, other people like to live in Worcester, and other people like to live in Boston. Uh, my, I have two children, who, well, a son and daughter-in-law, who live in New York, New York City. They think it's the greatest place in the world to live. I can't see it at all. So, the, you know, it's, it's individual. You pick out something you like to do, and you do it. But you know, there are realistic things. If you want to be a neurosurgeon, you, you don't go to a place where you have to be on a, at the ladder for 40 years before you are able to wield a knife. You do it that way. It's a very, you know, it, there's so many aspects, there's so many things you can do in medicine all the way from psychiatry to neurosurgery, that you're bound to find something you like and it'll pay enough so you can make a living. How do you, in your experience, how has competition among physicians been? Have they worked well together? Well, you think that's some good question. When, early on in my career, there were not enough psychiatrists in Worcester. There were maybe 20 in the whole city. And we took care of the North County and the West County, and we saw patients as far east as Marlboro, and there was no competition. You, you had to struggle hard to find somebody to take your patients. So it was collegial. You see, that's what we called it. It was collegial. 
But through the years, they've become, uh, more psychiatrists have come to town, plus the uh, uh, increase in the number of psychologists who could provide uh, psychotherapy. Uh, and it, it's made it a little tougher. And you see now, as a sidelight to what you asked, when I first came to Worcester, physicians never advertised. Never. Have. Now you see it. Everybody's advertising. And that was the aspect of the competition. And now this competition, I'm really not in favor of it unless we get a more educated public. You know, uh, you, you, you see the advertising for everything. They can be overwhelmed by an ad for a psychiatrist as quickly as an ad for uh, an automobile. And uh, I do deplore what I call marketplace morality in medicine. Uh, it, it, it troubles me to see the advertising reach what it does. But in today's New York Times, there's an ad for the New York Presbyterian Hospital for their cardiac surgery services picturing a rabbi as the successful patient. Now, uh, how do you beat it? Okay. So that, that's okay. it. <laughs> what do you think about um, the drug companies advertising their psychiatric directly, drugs? Directly to the patient? Directly to the patient. I think it's a high-risk thing, terribly high-risk thing. You know, you still have to have a reasonable education to know how to use drugs. Uh, I am now in a position where I take sleeping pills once in a while, and I review uh, how quickly does it work, how long does it work, what does it go with, what doesn't it go with. And the advertised medication doesn't tell you that. It, it's bad news. Uh, I saw an ad saying that there's going to be an importation of medication from Mexico and Canada that will be av available. Currently, prescription drugs will be available without prescription in the States. Not good. I do know in some advanced countries, Israel among them, you can buy prescription drugs over the counter. I, I think there's a risk in that but it's going to happen. How many uh, physicians have you interviewed? 